This is a mysterious traveler inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip that will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, as we journey with a young scientist into the unknown future. It's a story I call Operation Tomorrow. My story begins in a scientific laboratory cut out of solid rock many feet underneath the New York City University. Amidst the maze of electronic apparatus, Professor Wilbur Malcolm, a middle-aged pipe-smoking man, is making methodical tests aided by his new assistant, Fred Andrews. The main output coils seem to be working the way they should. You ready to meet us, Fred? Yes, Professor, but I wish I knew what we were doing. You will in a few seconds, my boy. Now wind up that alarm clock and put it here on this lead table in the center of the magnetic field. This old alarm clock? Yes. There, all right, it's in the magnetic field. Now what? Now I'm going to turn on the current. You give me the readings as we go along. Right, sir. Here we go. The readings, please. 1,000 volts, positive. Main output, 2. 1,500. All right, we've reached the critical voltage. Now watch the clock closely, Fred. The clock? Uh, yes, sir. Why, it's getting a little hazy, hard to see. Now it's transparent, as if it were made out of glass. Uh, what is this, Professor? Patience, my boy. Watch and observe. That's a scientist motto. The ticking's getting fainter, fading out. The clock is disappearing. P Professor, the clock has vanished. So it has. Gone completely. But, but where? Don't tell me you've discovered the secret of invisibility. Oh, something bigger than that, Fred. But watch now. I'm going to cut off the alpha tubes. Now I'll cut in the beta tubes. That will give us a negative charge and reverse the magnetic field. Ready, Fred? Yes, sir. Here we go. Greetings, please. 2,000 volts, negative. 3,000, negative. 4,000, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 10,000 volts, negative. Good, I'm holding the field at 10,000. Now watch where the clock was. I'm watching, sir. Good Lord. I see a ghost of a clock there. It's a misty outline. Now it's becoming clearer and clearer. It's transparent. Now it's almost solid. Oh, why, I can hear it ticking again. And there it's back. Yes, Fred, the clock is back. <laughs> and as you hear, still in good working order. But where was it? Where did it go? Where did it go? It went into the future. Into the future? Yes, my boy, that clock has just penetrated approximately one year into the future. You witnessed the demonstration of something that, up to now, has always been considered a fantastic dream. Time travel. Good Lord! Well, that's enough for today. You're coming home with me, Fred, while I tell you my plans. How did you stumble into this time travel effect, sir? Well, it came about just by sheer accident. My main purpose, which is a top-secret operation, is to develop electronic controls for atomic spaceships. You mean they've been developed? No, not yet, but it shouldn't be long now. Science is making incredibly rapid advances. Sometimes it worries me. When you travel so fast, there's a danger of collision. Yes, I know. We're all of us worried that the world is headed for a gigantic disaster, but there doesn't seem to be anything we can do about it. Perhaps there is. That's what I've been working around to tell you, Fred. Well, what, Professor Malcolm? Well, this time travel effect is that I stumbled upon accidentally. I've kept it a secret. You're the only person besides myself to know about it. I'm very flattered, sir. 
I know I can trust you and I need your help. I'm not sure we're ready for time travel. As you were saying, we're going so fast now, and many new discoveries that we don't know how to handle for the world's good. I hesitate to add one more to the list. I think I understand. On the other hand, maybe it can be used for mankind's benefit. I have a wild scheme, Fred. Very unscientific, and yet... What is it, Professor? Well, it's this. I propose to send you on a little jaunt into the future. Into the future? Yes, I want you to bring back information. I want you to bring back information. I want to find out what's in store for us mortals in the 20th century, Fred. If it's bad, war perhaps, just knowing about it in advance may make it possible to prevent it. Do you follow me? It would be like knowing in advance about a train wreck, and I'm then seeing it that it doesn't happen. I know you'd understand. That's why I sent for you. As soon as we've completed our tasks, I propose to send you through time 100 years into the future. For days and weeks, Fred Andrews and Professor Malcolm experimented until they were sure it would be possible to send a human being into the future and bring him back safely. At last, they were ready for the big test for the actual transmission of Fred himself through time. Professor, I, I'm already... Why are you hesitating? Well, Fred, since we've been working, suspicion has been growing in my mind. What suspicion, sir? I don't think this is going to work. But, Professor, we've sent dozens of objects into the future and brought them back. Even live animals, cats, dogs. Yes, but we've never brought back an object from the future itself. I mean, one we didn't send there. No, that's true. And I wonder if... Well, no matter, we'll see... Now remember, gather all the information you can and bring it back to this spot six hours from now. I'll activate the return field and then bring you back to 1950. Yes, sir. I'll do my best. I guess that's all. Good luck, my boy. Thank you, sir. 5,000 volts positive. 6,000 volts. How do you feel? I feel fine, Professor. 8,000 volts. 9, 10,000. Critical voltage. You're beginning to move forward into time. Getting transparent now. Can you hear me? Yes, Professor Malcolm, I can hear you, but you sound very far away. I can't see you any longer. It seems to be in the middle of a fog, a, a mist. I'm just surrounded by blackness. I can't hear or see anything. He's gone. Pray heaven he comes back safely. For a long moment, Fred Andrews felt as if he was spinning dizzily through an empty darkness. Then the feeling passed, and he cautiously opened his eyes to find himself standing in an empty room, the laboratory which he had just left a hundred years ago. Unsteadily, he crossed the room, and with difficulty, he opened the door. He gasped. Outside was a maze of corridors and hallways briefly lighted, as if the whole city had been carved out of the rock of Manhattan Island. As he stood there, someone came walking swiftly past him, an attractive girl in full military uniform. I, I, I beg your pardon? Yes. Uh, but, uh, can you tell me, what are you doing here? I, this section is forbidden to civilians. Uh, forbidden to civilians? I, I, I don't get it. How did you get past the guards? Where are your identification papers? I did, uh, now wait a minute. Since when does an American citizen have to carry identification papers? Ever since the war started, as you know quite well. Put up your hands. A gun! Now look, miss, you don't have to be threatening me. I'm harmless. Stand still. I want to see if you're carrying a weapon. Well, satisfied? The only weapon I have is a fountain pen. What's your name? Frederick, Frederick Andrews, Ph.D. Your draft card, please. Draft card? Look, what's all this about? War, draft card, identification papers, all these tunnels that have been dug down here? I, uh, I'm, I'm a stranger here. I don't know what you're up to, but no one could be that ignorant. You're coming along with me to see Colonel Phillips. Cur Colonel Phillips? He's the security officer for this sector, and I certainly hope you have a good story to tell him. 
So, your story, Mr. Andrews, is that you came here from the year 1950? <laughs> you must realize it's a very unconvincing tale. Completely unconvincing, in my opinion, Colonel. Well, it's the only story I have. I was born in 1923, and in 1950, Professor Wilbur Malcolm of the City University sent me into the future. Now I'm here, and, uh, oh, I forgot to ask the date. It's April 10th, 2050. Exactly 100 years. Professor Malcolm's calculations were accurate and almost to the minute. Colonel, in my opinion, this man is a very clever spy. A spy? <laughs> but look at that stuff. But look at that stuff you took from my pockets. It's a notebook, fountain pen, my, my driver's license dated 1950. Those coins and bills, the cigarettes. Surely they convince you that I came from 100 years ago. I think we can settle that question. Mr. Andrews, our technical department can tell whether this currency is genuine and approximately how old it is. Lieutenant French? Yes, sir. Send all these things by pneumatic tube to the technical department and ask them for an immediate report. I'll have the report to you in half an hour. When the report comes, Mr. Andrews, I'll know how to handle your case. If you're a spy, you know the penalty. Well, I'm not worried, Colonel. Now, may I ask a few questions? Are you at war? We are indeed at war. And these miles of tunnels I saw carved out of the solid rock? This city has retreated underground, Mr. Andrews. No one lives on the surface now. Good Lord! How long has the war been going on? We've been at war, Mr. Andrews, off and on, of course, with periods in between, in which both sides have rested up for 95 years. Well, a visitor at last. Hello, Lieutenant French. I'm sorry, Mr. Andrews, that we had to keep you locked up until you were clear. Does that mean you believe my story now? Technical Division says your story is true. Am I free now? Well, not exactly, Mr. Andrews. This is military sector, and you are a civilian, but I am to be your guide for the time being. Good, then. Suppose I call you Emily and you call me Fred. All right, Fred. There's a great deal I want to see and learn before I go back to 1950. Go back? You mean you can return? Of course. Professor Malcolm will turn on his gadgets to bring me back at 4 o'clock. That's only three hours. I'll have to report this to Colonel Phillips. Um, after I've reported, what would you like to do? I'm anxious to see what's going on, and I'd like to collect a number of books with the latest scientific and historical data to take it back with me. Yes, all right, I'll phone the Colonel, then I'll show you around. Fred, here's the plotting room for the flying bomb attack. Good Lord, it's as big as a theater, and it's dark. What is that big board with the lights on it? That's a chart board which records every flying bomb within a thousand miles of American territory. Self-guided missile entering detection over Greenland. General course south, southwest. I have it plotted. Send up interceptor rockets when it reaches zone four. Yes, sir. Rocket 3435 successfully intercepted at defense zone four. Now you see, Fred, two lights just went out. That means we sent up destroyer rockets which brought the bomb down. Rocket bombs 29 and 31 have eluded interception at Zone 3. Interception salvo at Zone 2. If they penetrate, use Interceptor L-100 at Zone 1. L-100 is our new top-secret interceptor, Fred. Hardly anyone knows how it works, but it never fails. Four more lights went out, then... Hmm, hmm. And here comes the report. Last four rockets successfully intercepted. Roger that. Well, Fred, what do you think of modern warfare? Oh, it's horrifying, and everybody here seems to take it so calmly. You can't get excited when a thing has lasted almost a hundred years on and off. That light, number 25, is still on and moving. It should have been destroyed by now. Do you suppose... Rocket number 25 has eluded interceptor attack by L-100. It has, but it can't have. Report on 25, please. Detection Base 103 reports number 25, apparently new type rocket of non-metallic instruction, able to battle sighting mechanism of L-100. 
Order tactical crew to search for fragments after the hit. Send general warning to the eastern seaboard area and give plotted strike prediction. Very good, sir. All personnel in the eastern district, all personnel, bomb strikes you in 10 seconds. Battery area, bomb strikes you in 5 seconds, 4 seconds. Bomb strikes you in 3 seconds, 2 seconds, 1 second. All personnel, bomb strike over. All right, Fred, I'll take you to the viewing room next. You can see for yourself what the city looks like in the year 2050. Lieutenant French reporting back with Mr. Andrews, sir. Very good, Lieutenant. Well, Mr. Andrews, have a good look around. Yes, sir. I saw the city through the television viewing screens. Not quite the city you left, is it? it it's, it's unbelievable. Just acres of twisted steel and fallen stone, the skeletons of giant buildings lying across one another, rusting. It's like the end of the world. Not quite. Perhaps not even the end of civilization. Man is an adaptable creature. But are we winning, sir? Nobody wins a war anymore, Mr. Andrews. We're holding our own. We hope that when the end comes, there will be peace on Earth forever. But how did it start, sir? We were trying so hard to prevent war back in the 1950. In fact, one reason for my trip back in time was to get information that might help us to keep war from breaking out. Lieutenant French, why did we think of that? Think of what, sir? If the world of the 1950 knows the truth, maybe it won't happen. Either they can prevent the accident that started all this back in 1955, or at least they'll know the truth when it does happen. Of course, sir. Mr. Andrews can take the true story back with him. What story? I don't follow you. Fred, you asked how the war started. Yes. It started because of an accident in an over-jittery world. Yes, my boy, it's a horrible irony. Fred, listen. During the 1950s, the government established a special experimental base in the heart of the Arizona desert in a little town called Red Rock in Red Rock, Arizona. Yes, that's right. The first space rocket was put into production there, and work was pushed on the problem of fuel. During the course of the experiment, an explosion occurred late in 1955. It was a terrible blast, wiped out the whole base. The first reports that were sabotaged, that the enemy had blown up the base because they were afraid they were on the verge of getting space flight. Before the truth became known, our newspapers screamed for retaliation. The enemy became panicky and decided to strike first, and phase one of the war was on. When we discovered the blast was really an accident, it was too late to stop. That's horrible, sir. War because everybody was too jittery? But it doesn't have to be. Don't you see, if you take back the true story before it happens, it won't have to happen. Now look, I've assembled a dozen books for you. The information in them will enable your scientists to prevent that blast at Red Rock Base. Now, Fred, you got to get the facts back to them. You just got to. I will. Professor Malcolm and I will see to it that this war doesn't start in our time. Good. Now come along. You've only got five minutes more. This is the exact spot where I was lying when I came through the time dimension, Colonel Phillips. You've only 30 seconds more, Andrews. Remember, impress the lesson of the accident of Red Rock on the world. These books, hold them close to you so they'll go back with you. Yes, sir. There, I've got a good grip on them. Fred? Yes, Emily? Uh, oh, just good luck. Thanks. Maybe I'll pay another trip to you in 2050. I hope so. It's 1600, if Professor Malcolm is on time. Look, Colonel, he's getting transparent. He's disappearing. Goodbye, Emily. I guess this is it. Hope to see you again sometimes. But, sir, the books, they aren't disappearing. They're just as solid as ever. Fred! Fred! What? I can hardly hear you. Everything's going gray and misty. Are you still there? Emily, are you still there? The books, Fred! Andrews, you're going back with the books. They're staying here. Ah, he's appearing. He's returning. Thank heavens he's safe. Fred, Fred, my boy, Fred! What's the matter? You're staring at me as if you didn't know me. Here, Fred, let me help you up. It's a, 
All right, Professor Malcolm. Professor Malcolm. Yes, don't tell me you don't remember. Professor Malcolm? Yes, Fred. What's the matter? My my head, it feels so funny. I can't seem to remember who you are or what's happened to me. What am I doing here? Well, Fred, how are you? Oh, Professor Malcolm, it's good to see you, sir. I can't tell you how I've been blaming myself ever since the experiment. Oh, nonsense. I haven't suffered any harm. Just a blank piece in my mind. I can't understand it. Do you suppose the experiment failed? Well, you were gone for six hours. Somewhere, that's all I know, Fred. If you did get to 2050... Fred? Yes, sir. Well, I have a theory that though we can move from the past to the future, it's impossible for anything belonging to the future to move to the past. The structure of time itself prevents that. I see. So if you did try to bring back any books or papers, they stayed behind. Hmm, you must be right. You can't remember because nothing that you didn't take with you will come back with you, even including sensory impressions in your brain cells. The very act of returning wiped out your memories. Maybe if I went again, we could find some way around the problem. There must be some way, sir. Not now, Fred. I'm dropping the whole subject for the time being. I've been transferred to the new assignment, and you are coming with me. Well, what is the assignment, sir? All spaceship research is now being concentrated at a new base now being developed. You and I are going out there to help develop a fuel that will take a rocket to the moon. I see. Where's the base, Professor Malcolm? Oh, someplace in the west. I believe they call it Red Rock, Arizona. This is the Mysterious Traveler. Well, time travel doesn't seem to be all it's been all it's been painted. Especially if you can't remember what's happened when you get back. You aren't worried about the future, are you? You know that tonight's story couldn't possibly happen. Or could it? Oh, you have to get off now? I'm sorry, but I'm sure we'll meet again. I take the same train every week at this same time. 